Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I am your host, Ben Pukulski. Today is a solo cast sitting here on a rainy day in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I uh, just got back from a workout, wrapped up my breakfast. I'll share that with you and have a little thought on ultimately the singular objective of weight training, why we weight train. And I'll give you guys a really simple breakdown on how to do that, what it is, how to be effective with it. And then the secondary objective of weight training that we should all be considerate of and kind of decode some of these processes, give you guys an insight into what now is being called the Pakulski method of body transformation and ultimately so much more insight in what you should be doing and maybe how you should be thinking about approaching your best body transformation, whether your goal is building muscle, you know, whether it's up to 20 to 30 pounds of muscle or more, you know, when my, at one point, my objective was putting on 50 pounds of muscle and I did that. And then I put a, up to 150 pounds of muscle from the time that I began, I started 155 pounds my, and I wasn't very lean to be honest. And my peak weight was 324 and I was about 7% body fat at 324. Now I'll be honest, I didn't love my physique when I was 324, but what I did understand was how to put on a ton of muscle. I understood how to train to put on a ton of muscle. And I felt pretty good at 324. I wasn't certainly fat. My aerobic fitness was great. But as I said, I didn't like my physique because of a few specific things which I can share. And I learned how to eat to support that amount of um, muscle, which is not easy, right? So gaining that obscene amount of muscle or what we call superhuman amount of muscle requires a lot of nuance, a lot of little details that sometimes get overlooked in the process. And you know, even though you may not want to put on 150 pounds of muscle, what I often say is success leaves clues, understanding the little nuances that I go through in my mind that you know, you can't see is what ultimately sets apart people who succeed from people who don't. And uh, one of the things that I say, you could watch me train all day and watch what's happening on the outside. But if you don't understand what's happening inside my mind, you'll have no idea how to progress at the rate and trajectory that I do. And I and ultimately let my clients do to transform at, right? What happens on the outside is this external focus. What happens on the inside is where the real gold is. And I hope to share that with you in today's podcast and so much more after a message from our amazing sponsors. Ladies and gents, here's a message from our friends over at Heroic. One of the most highly downloaded episodes of this podcast was with my good friend, Brian Johnson, previously of Philosopher's Notes, previously of Optimize. Now his business is called Heroic. And the reason he called it Heroic is because we're all on our own hero's journey. You are the hero of your own story. And Heroic does such an incredible job of giving you the resources and assets, and ultimately information and community to start to understand how to be the hero of your own story. I personally have gone through the 10-month heroic coaching program, which was such a wealth of information, such a true gift. 10 months uh, and the cost of it is comically low for what you're paying, for what you're getting. I, I, I promise you, you're getting such an incredible amount of value that if you're interested in being a coach, or if you're interested in ultimately optimizing yourself doing this 10-month coaching program, I couldn't give it more of a high recommendation. There's so much value. But right now, um, Heroic is off to you, offer you guys a 20% discount off the first year. And what's included in that app is just so vast. Uh, you're getting books. You're getting uh, philosopher's notes, so book summaries. You're getting videos from Brian. You're getting so much information. Um, so I highly suggest you guys head over to Heroic app. You can download it at heroic.us and use the code MUSCLE to get hooked up with 20% off your membership today. All right, ladies and gents, boys and girls, Organifi.com slash muscle is where you should go to get hooked up with the best greens, reds, and ultimately yellow super juice, super food drink that you can find, or at least the one that I'm using probably about two weeks of the month, and I'll explain exactly how I do that. So typically with greens juices, I like to rotate through. I don't like to use them all the time. So I'll use a, about one to two bottles of Organifi Green consecutively, and I'll usually mix one scoop of green with one scoop of red, usually mid-morning, just before I'm about to eat, uh, and oftentimes after I train to help my body get those nutrients that I need. I find Organifi to be a great source of multiple nutrients that my body needs. It gives me energy. I really feel like I'm doing something good for myself when I consume green juice. You know, there's days when you don't get to eat. There's days when you don't get to be perfect with your diet. Organifi makes me feel that I'm doing something great with myself. And I add the reds in there as a little bonus because it's so important for cardiovascular health. It's so important for muscle contraction, muscle pumps, erectile function. We wanna make sure we get those uh, bright red 
fruits and berries and beets into our body to improve nitric oxide production. So one scoop of green, one scoop of red is a great way to complement your current lifestyle and make you feel great. Head over to Organifi.com slash muscle and use the code muscle to get hooked up with 20% off. And now back to the podcast. All right, we're back and we're going to review the Pikulski method of body transformation, exactly how I walk you through the three step, eventually it'll be four step and I'll explain what the four step is, but the three step process that you should all be employing right now to um, transform your body, whether the goal is building muscle or losing fat, it should ultimately be the same process, at least up through the first two phases. The third phase can be different. I'll explain that to you. So if you think about muscle building in its, or, or let's call it resistance exercise in its simplest form, it has a singular objective, right? And that's strength. And even though you may say, no, Ben, I want to build muscle or no, Ben, I want to lose fat. In reality, what you're trying to get, by, if you are resistance training, in reality, what you're trying to get your body to do is be stronger. So why is that, right? Positional strength relative to your body weight is everything in life. It's, um, you know, I want to be able to move. I want to, if whether your goal is playing baseball or hockey or volleyball or running or crawling or having, you know, the ability to move through life uh, throughout an, an older age, uh, the objective is I need to be positionally strong relative to my body weight, right? Or relative to the, the endeavor I want to participate in. So I need my body to be able to first access this position, meaning I want to be able to get into a deep squat, a deep lunge, or whatever the sport or or physical endeavor requires of me. And the relative ease versus difficulty that it takes to get into that position. So let's say, for example, I want to be able to jump or run or play. Uh, I need my strength to weight ratio to be adequate or uh, beyond adequate, obviously, like more than enough for me to be able to do these things with relative ease, right? And as we age, you guys have heard me say this before, but the the number one thing correlated with the vitality in old age is quality of movement, right? If you see a person who's 90 and they're running and playing and jumping and, and moving well and not feeling like they're in pain versus someone who's who's 90 or beyond and not moving well and barely being able to stand up, that's really the difference, right? So we talk about longevity in isolation or sometimes we talk about longevity in terms of I want to live long, but do you want to live long or do you want to live well, right? Maybe we want both. And the absence or maybe the negligence of, of um, awareness around training is usually the gap for most people, right? If you move well into old age, you can compensate for a lot of things. Exercise is the fountain of youth, right? So even if you're not eating perfectly, even if you're having a couple glasses of wine, even if you know, I don't know, you're stressed, exercise is the path out of stress or it's the path to overcome these things. So let's walk through a really simple format, a really simple process that everyone should be applying regardless of your goal, right? If you are a young man or a young woman or an older man or older woman, the objective is still the same. The, the process is still the same. You got to figure out how to move your body and ultimately get it strong. So if we say the singular objective is I need to be strong, right? Resistance exercise, the reason we do that is we want to be stronger Okay, so how do we start that process? Well, first, that means I need to be able to move into position, right? I need to be able to go into the position that I'm trying to train. And ultimately, that's the full excursion of a joint, ideally, right? If we want to be um, resilient and have ultimate vitality into long age, if we think about simply walking through the thought process of, okay, I'm at the top of a squat versus two inches down versus two inches down versus two inches down versus two inches down. We need positional strength in every one of those ranges. And so we can look at the global movement, right? Which is the squat, or we can look at the joint by joint movement. So if I'm looking at a squat, well, first let's, let's go through the, from the bottom up, right? So it's the foot and ankle. And do I have enough ultimately dorsiflexion and plantar flexion to go through this range? Then we look at the knee. Do I have enough knee flexion to go through this range and be able to control my body weight and beyond? And then we look at the hip and then we look at the spine and every single vertebra of the spine is going through a range of motion. Even the ribs are going through a range of motion. Then we look at the shoulder joint and scapula. Maybe then we look at the neck and jaw. All these joints have to go through a specific range of motion and be able to first resist movement so that we call it stability, right? The ability to not move is stability. And then to be able to generate force to get out of that position or to get back into a certain position, right? And so all of those are important. So what is the prerequisite to strength? Well, first we must move well. And I've said this many times, but most people that I see are not 
fit enough to be uh, to transform their body. And what does fit mean? Well, they're not able to move well enough. So in order to transform your body, whether that be adding muscle or losing fat, you have to be able to, you know, quote unquote, work hard. All right. And I put that in quotations because working hard is not the objective, but you have to be able to increase your work capacity or increase your uh, work output, we'll say. Contracting muscles creates hormonal changes. Contracting muscle creates these secretory molecules called myokines that creates changes throughout the entire body, systemic changes throughout the entire body. But the prerequisite to all that is these muscle contractions that have to take place. And they need to tra- take place in, in a relatively intense way, right? You can't con- you can't curl the pink dumbbells and expect to elicit a response. You have to get stronger. And it doesn't matter how strong you want to be or how muscular you want to be. And I hear a lot of ladies say, I don't want to be big and muscular. It's so much harder to get muscular than you think. And even if you are someone who builds muscle relatively easily, you can, there's ways you can avoid adding huge amounts of muscle if that's what you don't want simply by manipulating your nutrition, right? So we'll talk about that in a subsequent podcast. But this is, again, the topic of the recent webinar that I did on training. First understanding is, well, the singular objective, and I'll tell you there is a secondary objective. Singular objective is, well, I want to get strong. And the secondary objective then is what? Well, I want to get strong and sustain it over time, right? So it's amplitude of strength and then it's duration of strength, right? So those are kind of the two primary things you want to think about. So first, I want to be able to um, improve my quality of movement as a primary objective. Secondary objective, well, I need to be get strong in all these relative positions. Third, I need to be able to maintain that strength over time. And that's ultimately how we define the objectives of weight training. First, move well. Second, get strong. Third, and sustain it over time. And that's it. If you were to break down programming or what we call periodization to its simplest root, that's it. So, as it, if I'm a pro athlete getting ready to play hockey or baseball or football or whatever, volleyball, first, when they come in the off season, getting ready for the season or getting ready for the Olympics, they don't assume that the only lever is I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can right from the beginning because they're going to get injured or, or break. Right? They're, that's that's. The, the worst thing you could possibly do. So the first thing someone would do in the off season, I suggest you take the mindset of a pro athlete and you say, okay, what do I need to do when I start this process? And that is what we call a foundational phase, right? We we ultimately prepare movements. We start greasing the groove a little bit. We start saying, hey, let's let's go through this exercise. Let's train the mind and the nervous system, and then eventually the muscular system, kind of in that order, uh, to perform this thing really, really uh, efficiently, effectively, well without discomfort, right? And well without discomfort means uh, I want to be able to go through the range necessary. It doesn't have to be a, a quote unquote full range unless you may need that in your life. I think it's a good idea, but I'm not I mean, myopically or dogmatically attached to saying every exercise needs to be a full range. Well, what am I capable of doing in this moment? Right. And that's a really important question for you to ask. If you're not capable of squatting ass to ankles, don't do it yet. Right. You don't have the strength to get there positionally. So don't do it. Right. And the way we can get stronger is by first getting stronger within the ranges we have access to. So if my range of motion is limited to a specific joint or in a specific exercise, stop. Stop trying to force yourself into a position you suck at, certainly under load, right? If you can't get there under your own muscular contractile power, don't make some weight shove you there because you're literally causing inflammation. You're driving up neural inflammation. And ultimately, if you can't contract into the position, which is your, your active structures, your muscles, the body becomes re- dependent and reliant on the passive structures your tendons, ligaments, joints. So as soon as you exceed a muscle's ability to contract or exceed its contractile range, because you've can't go there. As soon as you go past there and something shoves you into it, you're going to hurt yourself. You're predisposing yourself to short-term, long-term injury. And that's a really bad idea. So this old school mindset of like, oh, you just got to work hard and you got to kind of grind through it and you got to go through the full range. Here's the question to ask yourself, full range for what? Right? Full range for a movement or full range for a joint or full range for a muscle? All of those are very different things. So my suggestion is at the beginning of exercise, it's full range for a muscle. What can this muscle actively do? Lengthening and shortening under my own cognitive control, top-down control, right? Upper motor neurons contracting lower motor neurons or or signaling ultimately through your brain signals to the muscle. It's like this, what used to be called the mind-muscle connection, which I think is maybe accurate in some ways inaccurate, but what can my mind tell this muscle to do? And that's the foundation of training. And that's what MI40 was built on 10 years ago, actually 11 years ago now. We started MI40 for the end of 2010. Um, so when we built this program, originally this, which eventually turned into my business, 
It was really about people teaching people, one, how to move well, two, how to create an awareness of what this muscle does in isolation and train that. And what we saw around the world was millions of people, literally millions now, making miraculous muscle building changes, just miraculous changes, right? And that was literally step one that I taught you guys. It's like, hey, this is the basis of human movement. Like, hey, what is this muscle able to do in this moment? And let's challenge that, right? And then the next step is, okay, once I've, I've improved this movement, this ability to like, well, what I call quality of movement, which I then would say tr- kind of um, bleeds into quote unquote fitness, right? Most people aren't fit enough to transform. You need to be fit to transform your body, which sounds silly, but it's, it's a prerequisite. So you can't just go, I'm going to transform my body, right? How many people have tried a transformation, whether it be muscle bling or fat loss and failed, then blame nutrition or blamed maybe their mindset, their inability to follow through. Maybe they don't have discipline or motivation. Bullshit. If you moved well and you had enough energy, which is the two prerequisites to transformation, you would do anything. If I had an abundance of energy to get through all the things I have to do in a day and train and all these things, and I moved well, nothing would be a challenge. Hopefully that makes sense. So the, the absence of energy and the absence of quality movement is the thing, in my opinion, what prevents people from transforming. Because if you're not able to complete your daily tasks, your own daily tasks, meaning you can't, whatever, do work and, and just anything's beyond work. Well, it's not your lack of motivation that's a problem, right? It's your lack of energy that's a problem. So let's fix that. And we could talk about that in a subsequent podcast. And then when you get to the gym, if you have enough energy... And some people do, and some people steal their energy, right? They take it from caffeine or stimulants or whatever. They borrow from tomorrow to to provide energy for today. There's That's still an absence of energy. But if you did have enough energy because you cheated with a pre-workout, then your quality of movement is the next limitation to your fitness. So if we see those two things as the only real bottleneck to your ability to progress, we shouldn't we be addressing those in the beginning. So when you start a transformation process at muscle intelligence, that's what we address, Right, cellular energy production, quality movement, 30 days, go, figure it out. Guess what? It's not hard. It's actually really simple if you understand the steps. So once we've optimized for these things in this foundational phase of body transformation, we'll then allow you to, you know, you, you kind of check boxes, right? You're like, hey, yes, I can do this, yes, I can do this, yes, I can do that. And I have these, you know, eight to ten movements that I call, you know, foundational movements. And if you become good at those by practicing a lot in the first 30 days, you should become not necessarily an expert, but one proficient, capable. You don't have to be at even an unconscious competence. I'm hoping for conscious competence. Like I want you to be aware of how to do it correctly and be able to do it when you're consciously present. Eventually, when we get into the third phase, we're unconsciously competent. But in the first phase, we're consciously competent. You know how to do it. You know how to do it well. And if I ask you to do it with control and precision, you can do it well. That's phase one. 10 exercises. We probably do them three to four times every week. And that's how we change. Why do we do them three to four times every week? Because that's how you learn. And if people say, I've been that's too much. No, it's not too much. If you if you do the appropriate amount of volume, which is not a high amount of volume, it's a high amount of frequency. So if you're trying to learn something, and I'll give you the exercise you should be trying or you should be learning, or trying to learning. I'm not having no secrets here. Like even though I'm giving or I'm, I'm showing you how to do these in a, in a workout that I'm launching, uh, I'll tell you how what they are. I think you should be able to squat. I think you should be able to squat with a neutral spine. I think you should be able to lunge. I think you should be able to hinge at the hip, which looks like a deadlift, right? Multiple types of deadlifts could be stiff leg, could be conventional. I think you should be able to do an overhead press and that's with no pain in your shoulders. I think you should also be able to do an overhead pull down. You should be able to do a row bench press, a bicep curl, and a, did I say lunge? Hopefully I said lunge and a tricep exercise. Actually, when we talk about triceps, I don't even include a tricep exercise. I actually include just a narrow grip, close grip bench press, which kind of works your shoulders, kind of works your triceps, kind of works your pecs secondarily. But I think it's really good because uh, not necessarily because of its benefit for the pecs, but because of its benefit to shoulder positioning. So those are kind of your basic exercises that I think everyone should be doing in this foundational phase. And again, if you guys are interested, I'll tell you at the end of this podcast how you can get access to this program and these, these exercises and really, really great videos, descriptions. That's phase one, master these eight to 10 basics. And I say eight to 10 because um, some of the programs are right. Depending where the person is, if you're a super low level beginner, I'll include eight exercises. And if you're a little more advanced, we'll include 10 because I know some people psychologically want to do the bicep curls and maybe they want to do the calf raises. And I think those are important. Um, They just take time, right? I'm trying to keep the workout times under 60 minutes uh, because I think there's value in that as well. And learning how to to not just allow things to fill uh, an extraordinary large amount of space or space and time. So that's phase one. Phase one is about strength. Phase one is about duration. 
right? Improving positional strength, but ultimately positional strength is just relative to your body weight in phase one, right? I need to be able to move well in the absence of huge amounts of load. Now phase two, which is what we call an optimization phase. An optimization phase is this concurrent ascension increasing. And I say concurrent because it's it's done with increasing the volume and intensity of training. So we're ascending intensity ultimately, or also in set ascending recoverability concurrently. Because one of the biggest mistakes people make in phase one, you guys have heard me talk about this, is they do too much relative to what their body's capable of recovering from. If you do that, you don't transform. So we need to make sure in phase one, the, the training load is relatively low. Training frequency is relatively high. And we're learning how to train. It's kind of like you think of it like phase one skill acquisition. It's learning, right? It's laying a foundation. So when you watch Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, or Michael Jordan or uh, LeBron James play basketball, they don't have to practice dribbling or shooting. It's unconscious because they've spent so much time learning the skill. And this is kind of what we're doing here in phase one is we're learning how to just do this thing, do this thing really, really well, right? Everyone listening to this podcast has some physical movement in your life you do well, right? It may play, maybe playing the piano, it may be playing the, the guitar, it may be I don't know, playing a sport, even typing on a computer. It's a skill. At some point, you have to do it slowly and methodically and often. And now you do it unconsciously. And that's really what this first phase is about, is teaching you how to master the skill of exercise, of the most important exercises. And I say they're most important because then those are the ones that we can just start to expand on, right? We start to build off of those examples. A squat can be turned into many different variations of squat. And a deadlift can turn into many variations of deadlift. And a lunge can be turned into things like step up and Bulgarian split squat and so many variations that are offshoots of these different exercises. And those are the things that start to happen phase two two and three. So phase two is what, what, what otherwise would be known as an intensification phase, right? So intensification of muscle contraction, which means ex- I want you to get strong in these positions. So in the beginning, move well. Phase two, let's get better. Uh, you know, Now, it's a prerequisite that says, there is a prerequisite that says, you got to maintain the quality of movement. You can't get strong at the expense of poor movement, right? Or of, of quality movement. We have to get strong as well as maintain quality movement. So is optimization phase is a gradual progression toward higher intensities. So we've got 30 days of optimization. And again, there's intentional things happening behind the scenes to ascend your ability to recover. I need you to recover really, really well. Otherwise, you don't respond or adapt to this training. This is a gap for people as well. When you're trans- when you're training, period, training isn't the goal, right? Adaptation is the goal, right? Training is the stimulus or the signal or the stress. Your body adapts to stressors. So if we are aspiring to transform our body, the step one is I got to create the signal, which most people fail to do completely fail to do. You know, I go to a lot of gyms around the world and I don't like being critical of people that, but it's just observational. Like people just aren't getting it done in the gym. And and all oh, of this is another thing that came to mind this morning, watching people around the gym who clearly have a, have a desire to lose body fat or if I know them or if they communicate to me. And they're doing these low low value exercises, say low impact, but low value exercises. Uh, what's a low value exercise? Well, if you're trying to transform your body, what has high value? An exercise that incorporates larger muscle groups and that you're able to do well with some effort, right? Um, again, this is why phase one is this laying a foundation so we can do it well. So in phase two and three, we can do some effort doing things like bicep curls and wrist curls and I don't know, stuff that's really small, caloric expenditure, caloric demand, low value, right? Relatively low value. Not saying it's not important, but it shouldn't be a staple. And maybe 10% of your training to do these these little you know, rear delts, like great. It's important to structural balance, but it's not a foundational exercise. It's not something that's going to do anything for your body transformation, right? It may allow you to drive the car faster, metaphorically, right? It may allow you to keep the alignment in place. And that's very important. What we're looking for really is these high bang for your buck exercises that have a greater caloric demand. Example, squat, deadlift, lunge. Um, anything that involves bigger muscle groups, right? It doesn't have to even be the compounds. If you can't do the compounds, let's do uh, back extensions, uh, glute bridges, uh, hamstring curl, leg extensions, right? Leg presses, things that involve greater amount of caloric expenditure. Typically, I save those exercises for phase two and three because um, I think they're just great for caloric output. Right. So in phase one, very focused on compounds, very phase two, kind of both. We want to get better at the compounds, but we start adding in what I call the auxiliary or synergistic exercises. What's a synergistic exercise? What exercise that makes the, the first 10 exercises more effective? Right. So if I need you to get stronger to squat, I'm going to put weight on your back. I need your back to not bend. 
So I need some exercises that allow your back to not bend. I need your glutes to contract. I need your quads to contract. I need your calves to stabilize. I need your feet to be strong. Right? These are all exercises that need to be built into that phase two thought process. So think about phase one, basic stuff. Phase two, start making it a little more complex. Right? Start adding in more. Uh, intensity, more contractile ability. Now, guys, I know this sounds like a lot, but it's really 30 days. If you guys go through a simple 30 days of, hey, I'm going to do this really, really well. And I'll say this, the attention in, in the first 30 days is not even about working hard. I tell people like it's probably 70% effort, right? It's really just about allowing your body to move fluidly, right? I want to try to, one, feel what's happening inside my body. Many people are very disconnected from what's happening inside their body. I want to be able to feel my body. Am I moving fluidly, right? Or does it feel kind of like, I was, the analogy uses like a spotlight versus a strobe light, right? Is it is it like a nice fluid contraction that stays on? Maybe the intensity of the light gets brighter or is it, you know, this like a light contract a little bit, oh, contract a little bit and you're moving, but it's like a, like a jerky movement, right? It's like, I don't know if I'm contracting, I'm kind of on, I'm kind of off. And then your body is just distributing the tension rather than directing the tension to one small place. So that's an important thought when it comes to optimization of phase one is it's a fluid movement. Now, here's the thing. What has to partner or couple with any type of resistance training for most people to ensure that they're moving fluidly? What should you couple that with? Mobility training, right? You want to make sure that your muscles are sliding really well, right? You want to lubricate the joints. You want to make sure the muscles are moving really well. I call it fluidity, right? If I'm dancing or boxing, I want to have a good amount of fluidity. Like I want to flow, but I also want to have a good amount of rigidity, right? If I'm boxing, I got to be able to strike and be, be tight if somebody hits me. If I'm dancing, I got to be able to hit those poses, those positions. Same thing in weight training. Got to be able to be really flow really well. So learning how to control the amount of muscle that's on and off. Because I don't want it all to be on all the time, in the, at least in the beginning. Eventually, I might, but I want to learn how to say, okay, how can I flow through this? That's a good uh, mental image to bring with you. Is like, I want to flow through this. Does it feel like it's jerky? Does it feel like it's a bit uh, sloppy, or does it feel like it's really fluid? And if you watch athletes that have an amazing body, most of the time, they're very fluid, right? And so then we've. we've wind that up even one more level. That requires good quality tissues, right? It means it requires tissue health, which means low inflammation, high micronutrients, good hydration. That's the nutritional aspect of phase one, right? Okay. So moving on from uh, the optimization phase, which is really focused on the ascension of uh, intensity. So I need to get strong in the in all these basic exercises with some additional complementary or synergistic exercises. Now phase three, if you're doing this correctly, what we call my performance phase, and this is where you really specialize. And in phase three, you can say, hey, I really want to put on as much muscle as I can. and Or it's like, hey, I want to lose as much fat as I can in the shortest amount of time, right? Both of them require prerequisite movement quality and intensity of contraction. The training is different. If you want to add muscle versus lose fat, it can be, it can be similar, but it, it's definitely different. Um, it can be similar exercises, just different rest periods, different uh, rep numbers, right? Slightly different. Nutrition is obviously different. The amount of aerobic fitness and anaerobic fitness you could be different, uh, but phase three is where this finally becomes this, this differentiation. The first two phases could be very, very similar, very, very similar. So phase three, now we're like, okay, Ben, I want to put on 30 pounds of muscle or I want to put on 20 pounds of muscle. Okay. Again, I'm not saying that's going to happen in 30 days. But we can certainly get you moving in the right direction. It may that may these first two phases may lay the foundation for the next six months of your training if you do it right. Or it may be for the next five years of your training if you do it really well, because we're we're developing unconscious competence. So phase three then looks like uh, okay, let's let's take all these skills that we've learned, take the strength that we've learned, and now start accumulating a little bit more work, right? Maybe a little more duration, like I talked about in the beginning, maybe a little more amplitude, right? Maybe a little more density in the workouts, right? Maybe, maybe not, maybe a little less density, but more total volume. So that's if I'm trying to build muscle. Now, if I'm trying to lose fat in that phase, I still need to take this quality of movement and this intensity of contraction, the strength that I've built. And I want to apply it to working hard over probably short periods of time with a huge amount of density, right? Or an increased amount. This would be huge. An increased amount of density. So this is an awareness for coaches out there who are doing a lot of things wrong. You're, one, you always miss the first two phases because you simply don't understand. And that's okay. You've never taught this stuff. But uh, phase three, you know, those phases need to be there. And if you're not, you're, you're leaving uh, muscle on the table. I should say this, put, most people come into, or they hear something like this and they assume that these first two phases in some way lack progress or lack external transformation. And that is 
far from the truth. Most people in my community make amazing, actually all people I think in our community, if they follow the plan, make amazing transformations in the first 30 days and then incredible shifts in the next 30 days, right? So foundation optimization, we make incredible shifts, like big, big, big changes. And it's just because you're doing things better. It's this concept of like uh, dropping a bomb versus laser targeting, right? So we're learning to laser target muscles. We're putting so much direct tension, so much direct work through a muscle that it becomes more calorically demanding. Right, the body ends up being um, metabolically challenged a lot more, even even um, creating more muscle damage, which creates more of a recovery demand. Those are direct results of training with improved efficacy or training with the, the muscle intelligence method. Um, so then phase three, as I say, we're coming back to this. Okay. Now, if I want to burn fat, well, maybe I take these things that I'm really good at, this performance that I've acquired, and now I sustain it over time. It's more of a duration thing. And, and oh, this is the one thing I was getting onto. You got to build progress into the plan. You hear how I'm intentionally building progress in the plan. Most of you, if we asked you the question and I said, hey, uh, if 12 months from now, you looked and felt and performed the way that you want to, would you be happy with that? And I think everyone, almost 100% of people would say yes. And yet most people put this timeline on of like, oh, I got to do it in 90 days. And yeah, you could just a lot you can do in 90 days. But if we just took the timeline and stretched it over 12 months and said, hey, let's take it, let's take a few baby steps in the beginning. So like learning how to play the piano or, or learning how to type on your keyboard, just learn how to do these things well first. And then eventually I could do them really fast and, and you know, ultimately create great things. It's the same thing. Take a month or two months or even three months in the beginning if it takes it that long and lay a foundation. And when it comes to performance, now your body feels good when you drop the hammer, right? We want to lay on the, the intensity, we want to lay on the volume, we want to lay on the total work, but you simply aren't capable of doing that yet. You're simply not capable, right? You, most people, as I said, are not fit enough to transform because they don't move well and they're not strong. And if you're positionally weak, especially as you try to increase weight, if you're positionally weak, that, that weight will become uncontrolled and push you into positions you don't control, right? You'll go to the bottom of a bench press and you won't have control. So then you start to dump pain into your shoulder. You go to the bottom of the squat, you won't have control. You'll dump pain into your lower back or into your SI joints, into your knees, because you don't know how to contract the muscle with control in those positions, right? So it's about this positional control. I get to the position and I know that my my muscles are actually contracting. This load is under muscular control, right? So that's the difference. So if I get to the bottom or the top of the exercise, which is always where we lack control, and the middle is usually easy, the bottom, the top, if you lack control, if you can't consciously feel your muscle contracting, you're not doing it correctly, right? So that's like step one. Can you feel the muscle contract at the top and the bottom? I used to say, get strong at the extremes of the range. That was one of my six pillars of exercise. Get strong at the extremes. If you do that, your body will change. Your joints will feel better. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that soreness. Sorry, I should say that differently. Do you realize that joint pain is not supposed to be a part of exercise? Like if your joints hurt, this is a reality check. If your joints hurt, you're doing it wrong. Bottom line, it's not correct. It's not like, oh, it's a, it's kind of part of the course. You see these dudes who've been training for 25 to 30 years and like, oh, my joints hurt. Why? Right. I've got some joint stuff from when I trained like an idiot in my early 20s <laughs> or late teens, right? I had a muscle tear in my shoulder very early in my bodybuilding career. And it's just because I was being a dumbass. And like, I didn't know any better. I was just kind of following what all the other monkeys were doing, right? It's monkey see, monkey do. So I was slinging weights and you're trying to get strong because my ego says, I want to be as strong as that guy. Dude, you move like shit. Why do you want to get strong, right? Would you get behind the wheel of a car going 200 miles an hour if you don't know how to drive? It doesn't make sense. What the hell are you doing? Let's learn to drive first, right? Would you get on a motorcycle if you didn't know how to drive a motorcycle at 100 miles an hour? It doesn't make sense. You got to learn how to control this damn thing first. Actually, there's a brilliant lesson I learned recently. I took a, a motocross lesson and my son and I did it together. As, you know, I love to do amazing dad stuff with my boy and my daughter wasn't into it. Otherwise, I dragged her too. Um, it was a great bonding moment for my son and I. And, and the instructor said to us, he's like, hey, uh, before you can go out of first gear, you need to prove to me that you can go as slow as you possibly can. So meaning you get, he put these um, pylons really close together and he said, I need you to roll between these pylons in con with control, basically as slow as you possibly can and not fall over. Because he said, well, if, if you can control the slow, then I know you can control the fast. And I thought that was a great lesson for life, right? Put, put the pylons close together, right? Force yourself to be very mentally present and like, I got to do this because you're just barely touching the throttle, right? You're, you're barely just feathering the throttle. You're barely feathering the clutch and you got to keep it in gear, but you got to just, just get it going. And, and it forces you to be present in that moment. If you're honest with yourself, and you're listening to this podcast. Do you, would you say that you're present during your workouts or would you say that you are absent during your workouts? If you're honest with yourself and most of you will say, I'm absent. Some of you will say, uh, I'm, 
I punctuate the workout, right? Occasionally, I realize I have moments of conscious awareness. I'm sometimes conscious. Some of you will say I intentionally become unconscious, like I want to mute what's going on. I listen to music or I listen to audiobook or something like that. But let me tell you guys, you're missing what I think is the one of the greatest opportunities, one of the greatest benefits in exercise is becoming more conscious. And nobody's talking about this, right? Everyone assumes bodybuilding and muscle building is this is for mindless uh, meatheads. In reality, it's the exact opposite. I've used exercise over the last 10 years to become incredibly more conscious. And uh, that's because it was a choice. And listen, you can definitely do it both ways, right? There's two ways, multiple ways to do everything. But if you want to get the most out of exercise, you can wear headphones. The reason I'm wearing headphones right now, because you're know, watching the video, so I don't hear anything else around me. I can stay in my own thoughts. I can stay in my own body. I can become present, right? I do that sometimes in exercise. In the beginning, if you feel it's hard for you to focus, start wearing headphones, no music, just noise canceling. And the good thing about this is you hear your own breath. I can be present in my breath. I can be present in my body when I'm training. It allows me to, to understand what am I feeling? What feels tight? What feels weak? What's not contracting really well? Right? I can, I can move through that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that is valuable for you. Um, these are things that I should share that I've really just learned, or not learned, but become more aware of recently. The challenges that men over 40 are facing are, are different than in your 30s and certainly different than your 20s. And when I was a professional bodybuilder, I had such myopic goals, much such myopic objectives. And therefore, I had a very specific process that I followed. Like I could put muscle on anyone because I did it. Um, I did a lot and I made a lot of mistakes. And a lot of these, these errors or these challenges that people are facing, I didn't realize existed until five years ago or maybe three years ago, right? I didn't know because I was so focused on just like gas pedal, go faster. I did it well. You know, I, I made a lot of progress. I was very happy with my bodybuilding career. I think we had a lot of great successes. Could I have been better? Yeah, for sure. I could have been better. Certainly in the beginning, you know, a lot of things, there's a lot of reasons why people, hey, Ben, why did you retire? I retired because I had children and for no other reason than I thought. You know, this bodybuilding stuff isn't healthy, as you know, you guys understand it's not healthy. You know, I should say it differently. Muscle building is incredibly healthy. What we have to do sometimes to become some of the best bodybuilders in the world at the top of the sport is not healthy. Being 300 plus pounds is not healthy, regardless if you're enhanced, we'll say like anabolically enhanced or not. And it being anywhere over that amount of weight or anywhere near that amount of weight is unhealthy. And I knew that in my life. I just wanted to. I had a goal, like I had a very specific objective and I was dogmatically or myopically uh, moving toward it. So for better or worse. Um, so ladies and gents, I hope that was useful for you. A few key action items, simplify your phase one, spend 30 to 60 days on a small number of things. If you want to learn how to do this in the most effective way possible, I have put together a 90-day body transformation program. This is not a coaching program. This is a body transformation program that I literally spell out every step of the way, what you need to be doing, uh, the workouts, the nutrition, the videos, the execution videos. There's a lot of support videos as well. There's a lot of what I call problem solving, troubleshooting videos like, hey, how to improve insulin sensitivity, how to drop your belly fat, um, how to optimize digestion, how to improve sleep, how to do breath work, how to improve your mindset. Those are all videos that are included. Uh, actually, I call them master classes because I'm going pretty deep on these things, not just like, hey, here's a short video. I, think I try to keep them under about 10 minutes. So it's not hugely time consuming. My suggestion is you watch one video a day. Right, watch one video a day. And by the end of this, you will have such a deep understanding of what goes into the body transformation process that uh, you'll look completely different, feel completely different, and most importantly, know how to do it for the rest of your life. I think it's a sad state of affairs when somebody gets in shape once and that's the only day for the rest of their life they're in shape. Right, Getting in shape is easy. Staying in shape requires thought, requires knowledge, uh, requires consciousness. Right, You have to be aware of your, your unconscious programming to want to eat too much, to want to not move. To, your body's programmed to be lazy. Right, your brain literally is programmed to be lazy. Your brain is programmed to avoid discomfort. That's what we're programmed for. You have to learn to consciously overcome that. I've been studying this stuff a lot, lot, lot lately. Actually, if you guys saw my desk behind my computer or behind the that computer, you would you would laugh at the number of textbooks that are stacked up that I'm reading lately. So I have a greater understanding of the hormones that influence body transformation. I did say when I started this podcast that I'll tell you what I had for breakfast this morning. So I got to the gym at seven. So I always got seven on Monday, Wednesday, Friday because there's a class from six to seven. It's very, very busy. So I got seven. And uh, sure. I, so I've been playing baseball lately and I hurt my hip flexor slash groin slash lower abdomen. It almost feels like a hernia, but it's not. I think just like sprinting or pitting or all the, all the things. Um, so I had to do kind of a rehab style workout, really focusing on activating the adductor, lengthening the glute, activating the abdominals. So I worked up some decently heavy deadlifts, did some pull-ups, did some leg raises, um, did a bunch of lunging, did a bunch of prowler work. 
What else did I do? I did some glute bridges for the first time in a while. I love glute bridges, by the way, for most people who have weak glutes. I don't, but most people do. Um, I did that and then I felt great. So I, it was probably a hour, 10 hour, 15 minute workout, broke a good sweat. Wouldn't say it was record breaking because because of the little injury I was working through. No one would say it's an injury. It's a little, uh, call it a niggle, little, little muscle strain that I'm working through. Came home, uh, did an hour of reading on neuroendocrinology and uh a little bit about endocrinology of exercise, and then had some fish, had some vegetables. I had a huge plate of vegetables, actually, an enormous plate of vegetables, which was cauliflower, broccoli, broccolini, red peppers, uh, parsnips. I had like five or six different vegetables in there. Um, I had a, a few pieces of uh, fish, and it was pickerel, I think. And then I had some chimichurri on top. Of those, those of you who don't know, chimichurri is like my uh, garment, or my garnish of choice lately. It's fantastic. We make it at home. After spending some time in Costa Rica, we actually went to this amazing Argentinian steakhouse and shot a video with them on how to make their chimichurri. We borrowed the recipe. Thank you to the gentleman in Nosara, Costa Rica. I forget the name of their La Brasa, La Brasa in Nosara, Costa Rica. Wonderful place, amazing food, cooking an amazing, amazing steak, and the chimichurri is fantastic. Thank you, those gents, for teaching me the recipe. Uh, if you guys do want my recipe, we will be releasing on social media. We've have released on social media, but we're releasing it again. And I'm shooting a ton of seven minute muscle meals for you guys. Anyone who joins my 90 day program is going to get a library that's constantly growing of seven minute muscle meals. I've got so many meals and I just, all my meals that I, that I prepare take seven minutes. It's always meat, it's always vegetables, and it's always something that goes on top, which is like a chimichurri or a cabbage that I have pre-made or pre-purchased. So it literally doesn't take a lot of time. All those people that make excuses around time and why it's so hard to transform, why it's so hard to lose fat, bullshit. If you're just not being honest with yourself or you don't understand the process yet. And that's why I'm here. That's why Muscle Intelligence is here to support you in that journey. Ultimately, guys, I want you to realize that you can. I want you to realize it's possible for you. And what lives behind the body transformation is so much greater than the physical benefit itself. It's it's just feeling good every day, waking up energized, waking up with an abundance of energy, waking up with a great sex drive, waking up with a great attitude, with confidence. All this stuff lives behind this body transformation because when you follow through on something that ultimately is very challenging for some people, well, relatively, when you follow through, you realize that everything in life is, life is possible for you. Intentionally subject yourself to hard things every day because what you're trying to do is prove to your unconscious mind that no matter how hard it is, you can do it. Right? I once heard 50 Cent say, he just believes believes in himself, no matter what it is, no matter what's in front of him, he knows he can do it. And so what gives someone like that, that attitude, right? I, I, I'm similar. And I was like, well, give me that. Well, it's, it's sometimes not through no fault of your own, accidentally being thrown into positions or, or situations that are well beyond what you think you're capable of enduring. And you just finish. You're like, oh shit, I can do this, right? So that can happen by accident in life or that can happen on purpose in life, right? So for those of you that are looking to subject yourself to hard things, start in the gym, right? Start outside the gym, whatever you want to do, start. And the gym in my mind is just a really controlled environment from which to start to subject yourself to hard stuff. I don't want to do this. The high intensity cardio, the deadlifts, the squats, the things that, that we should be doing every day, that ultimately just become easy, right? Our society is becoming weak. We're becoming soft. And through no fault of our own, children are not being exposed to anything difficult. They have no rules, no discipline, no structure. And then they reach their early adult years and they're like, I'm, I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I don't have any belief in myself, right? Yeah. Because you haven't done anything hard. You're soft. That's just an unfortunate reality. Again, I know there's other chemical reasons why people get anxious and depressed. I get it. Don't bite down my, don't jump, jump down my, my throat or bite off my head. But there's, there's definitely a lot of just like, hey, you're fucking weak. And again, I'm not saying that I had a strong childhood, but learning that you're capable of so much more than you think is an important part of becoming a strong adult. And for parents out there, one quote that I use in my children is, I'm not here to make you stronger. You know, people sometimes as a parent, you're like, what am I here to do? Like, what is my role in this human's life? I'm not here to make you stronger. You're going to make yourself strong. I'm here to show you how strong you already are, right? That's what I'm here to do, right? I'm here to facilitate your life, to facilitate the things you want to do and make you realize you're fucking awesome. You were born awesome. You have a lineage of amazing ancestors behind you. You have amazingness in your soul and in every cell of your body. And I'm just here to help you and realize that if you look over your shoulder, you're not alone. That's it. That's what I say to my kids all the time. I'm here to show you how strong you already are. I hope parents out there, you can take that and realize that your kids are a reflection of you. If you're not enjoying your time with your kids or you're not having a great relationship with your kids, start looking in the mirror, start realizing your shortcomings are, are becoming imparted on them. Uh, and again, I get that's not always the case because sometimes 
there's definitely kids can be assholes, can't they? <laughs> Let's be honest. Kids can be kids can be challenging. Be learn to be patient in those moments. And and sometimes they're just testing you. I always just take on the mindset mindset of the shit testing me. See how far they can push me. And uh, I take on this mindset of like, okay, I love you unconditionally. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, I love you unconditionally. And that's been a really powerful way for me to approach our dynamic because nothing, they, they get mad, they get upset, they get angry with me, they say mean things. And I just stand there and I receive it and I say, I love you. I love you unconditionally. And I kiss them and I hug them and I realize, make them realize like, oh man, this guy actually does love me. Holy smokes. I can do that. And he still loves me. Like, yeah, I do love you. And, and then I, and then when it's not in an emotional moment, I draw the line in the sand. I'm like, don't ever do that again. Don't speak to me that way. I love you no matter what, but I'm not going to accept your bullshit. <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, thank you very much for joining for, uh, for listening to the podcast, for continuing to come back to the Muslim Intelligence Podcast. And I hope I continue to provide value for you. Um, one of my missions in this world ultimately is to support men and women in uh, ultimately feeling great, showing up at your highest and best. So you can be a hero in your life. And for me, that means showing up for yourself first. I mean, taking care of your body, taking care of your nutrition, taking care of what goes into your body. I get life can be stressful and you've maybe developed some compensatory habits that say, hey, when I'm stressed, I do this, I drink, or I take a pill or I eat. And Guess what? You could change those habits. Is it easy? No, right? Is it going to take some thought? Yes. Is it going to take some habit? Yes. Uh, but you can. You absolutely can. And you have a support network or network around you. And this, what we're calling our Muslim Intelligence Community of Champions is here to support you in everything you do. Why are we calling Community of Champions? Well, I'll tell you what. You know what champions do? Champions win, right? Champions don't quit. Champions follow through. You may not be perfect the first time, right? You may not win the first time. But you keep coming back, you keep coming back, you keep coming back, and eventually you win. Why? Because everyone else quits, right? So I always use the metaphor of like the first time you played Monopoly, did you win? No. Well, the first time you transformed your body, did you, did you finish or did you get it exactly where you wanted? Maybe not. Do it again. Did you win the second time you played Monopoly? Maybe, all right? Or whatever chess, whatever game you want to insert there. Probably not, but eventually, if you do it again and again and again, you get it, you get it right. So realize life is a, is a process. Life is an evolving, living, breathing process for us all to engage in. I'm not perfect. I'm learning every day. I have struggles. Man, do I have struggles. The last 12 months of my life has been the hardest 12 months of my life by far. I mean, relative, right? Maybe, maybe there'll be more, but I hope not. I hope, I hope, uh, well, I hope I'm strong enough to endure whatever the world sends me. I often say, be the lighthouse in the storm. Things around you are hard, but you know, you are steadfast in your values and who you are. You always show up consistent. Work in progress. Thank you for being here, ladies and gents. Thank you to our sponsors for today. And uh, I appreciate you guys joining us. And if you're not already subscribed, to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, uh, head over to all the amazing places where you can subscribe to podcasts. So we are on YouTube, we are on Spotify, we're on Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you can subscribe to the best podcast in the world. Thank you very much. Our numbers on the podcast continue to grow because of your reviews, your shares, and ultimately your subscriptions. So subscribe, review, and share with at least one person you know and love who wants to live their greatest life in a body they love, whether you're a coach, whether you're someone who wants to transform, we're here to support you. Drop me a message on Instagram, drop me a message on YouTube or a DM. I do read the messages if you guys see that. Thank you for being here and uh, live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.